Hello, welcome to my garden shed. <laughs> this is the nearest thing I've got to an office, so it'll have to do. A couple of weeks ago, I posted a video asking if anybody had any questions on navigation that they would like answered. Today was the first opportunity I've actually had to look at those questions. I've I haven't even looked at them all yet, so I'll try and answer them in the order that they arrived. And uh, if I give the wrong answer, which is <laughs> sometimes likely, um, can somebody put the correct answer in the comments box? And uh, that should keep everybody happy. So I'll go through them in the order that they arrived and uh, see if I can, see if I'm not stumped. So here we go. The first question is from Hanako in Japan. And she says that she is 13 years old. Hanako, I hope this isn't a homework question. <laughs> You'll get me in trouble with your teacher. Anyway, Hanako says, can you tell me what was the first map? Oh God, <laughs> first question and I'm stumped. Wow, that's a good question. Hanako, I actually don't know the answer and I'll tell you now, nobody else does. So anybody who tells you they know what the first map was is, it's up to you if you believe them or not. Now, th there is a map that's engraved on a woolly mammoth tusk in uh, Eastern Europe that was found, and that has been carbon dated to 27,000 years ago. So it's very old. But that's obviously not the first map because somebody must have taught that person how to make maps. So I'll take a guess. <laughs> many, many thousands of years ago, possibly hundreds of thousands of years ago, somebody asked somebody else a direction to somewhere. And that person got a stick and they drew a diagram in the, uh, in the sand. <clears throat> now, they may have said something like, go to the hill and walk across the hill until you get to the river and then turn left until you get to the forest. So that's probably the first map. But after that, sometime after that, somebody else may have asked someone else, you know, how to get somewhere. And instead of drawing it in the sand with a stick, they may have got some burnt wood, a bit of charcoal, and drawn the uh, description onto the back of some tree bark and handed them that piece of tree bark. And there you have the very first map. But, as I said, I don't know. But it was definitely thousands and thousands of years ago, long before anything pictures, you know, you can see pictures of old maps on the internet, tens of thousands of years before that was the very first map, but I actually don't know. Um, so <laughs> it's not a very promising start, is it? Somebody asked me a question, and I actually don't know. Next question, this is from Western in America. Can a bubble in a compass be fixed? And what type of fluid is in the compass? The second part is easy. It's Normally most compasses are filled with some form of kerosene and the better the quality of the compass, the more rarefied the kerosene is. The kerosene just acts as a dampener. So the needle will spin around, point north, and then it'll settle down a lot quicker because it's got a, a dampening fluid on it. The s first part, can a compass bubble be fixed? Some people were gonna disagree with this, but I would say no. <laughs> The bubble may disappear if the compass is taken somewhere else or it's warmed up, but that doesn't mean to say that the problem has been fixed. You know, If the compass is taken back into the same conditions that caused the bubble, then the bubble will reappear. So, you know, it's... Uh... Now, there's two reasons why you get bubbles in compasses normally. One, you've got a leak. So some of the kerosene is coming out and that's allowing air in. Um, in which case, simple, just get another compass. There's, you can't fix them. Um, the other reason is that the compass is in an area where the pressure or the temperature is lower. Like when you go up a mountain or you go into a cold climate. And the, how much this affects the compass simply depends on the quality of the compass, you know, and also normally the price. <laughs> on the inside of the compass material, the plastic or the glass or the brass or whatever, there are microscopic flaws, indentations and scratches. And when the compass is filled with kerosene, those microscopic flaws fill with, fill with air. And the pressure of the kerosene holds that air in place. 
If you take your compass into, as an example, if you take it up a mountain where the air pressure is lower, then the pressure of the kerosene is lower. So the pressure that's holding the air inside those microscopic floors is also reduced and the air can escape and it joins together and forms a bubble. And it's the same thing if you take it into cold temperature. Um, that reduces the pressure of the kerosene, once again, allowing the air that's held inside those microscopic floors on the inside of the compass to escape into the body of the compass and you get a bubble. Now, if you warm the compass up or you take it down to a lower altitude, then that increases the pressure and the air is forced back into those microscopic floors. And people seem to think, I've seen it on the internet, and that solved the problem. But it doesn't, the air is still there. The better the quality of the compass, the less air there will be, simple as that. It's, um, but if you do operate in a cold environment or at high altitude where you normally see a bubble, then my suggestion is get a compass that doesn't have liquid into it, like you know some Kamengas or even some Bruntons, but get a compass that doesn't have fluid inside it and that will solve the problem. In fact, that's the only way to solve the problem normally. Right, next question. Um, here we go. This one is from Ruben, who says he's in the UK. Can you use a watch to navigate? Ruben, yes you can. I've made a video about it. I'll put the link in the description box. The basics are you point the hour hand of the, your watch at the sun. Halfway between the hour hand and the sun is approximately south. Um, I say approximately because it only works twice a year, really. It only works on the spring and the autumn equinox when the day and night time is the same length. Any other time of year, though, it will tell you approximately where south and north and east and west is and it'll stop you walking around in circles in the mountains. So yes, you can use a watch to navigate. Um, next one is from Vincas from Lithuania. For measuring distances, are there any lightweight tools that I could take in my backpack? Yes, <laughs> it is, I'm, I'm not being flippant or funny here, but the obvious thing, yes, you can use is a map. There's not, that is very lightweight and it can go into your rucksack. A map is probably the lightest and most accurate way to measure distance. And you can measure distance on your map using the ruler on the edge of your compass. And if you look on the bottom of your map or the sides, there'll be a scale that will tell you how far you've traveled. Now, I'm guessing that you mean, are there anything else other than a map? There are a number of phone apps that, which claim to be able to measure distance, you know, when you point your phone at something. I've never tried them, so I can't tell you how accurate they are. And there are lots of different range finders that you can get in binoculars and small telescopes. These are available on, on Amazon. Once again, I've never used them, um, so I can't tell you how accurate they are. I would guess that the military versions are extremely accurate. If you, you know, a, a pair of binoculars with a rangefinder on it for military purposes is going to be very accurate, but it's also going to be very expensive. So next question. Um, Richard. Although you feature many types of compasses, you tend to use silver in most videos. Is there a particular reason? <laughs> Richard. Um, firstly, I have to say, as I always do, that I don't receive any commission, payments, or any other benefits from any compass manufacturers. Um, on my YouTube channel, I don't do these very strange which compasses are best type videos because there's no compass that's best. Each compass is designed for a specific use in a specific area. And the best compass is the one that you can use that is designed for the use that you're going to use it. Um, anyway, the reason I use silver compasses is the Silver Expedition 4 is because for my location and the type of walking that I do, I find that that's the ideal tool. Other people may be walking in different types of terrain and have a different use or expectation of their compass, so they'll need something different. But I use the Silver Expedition 4 because for my personal use, I think it's the ideal tool, but other people will have different ideas about that. I don't recommend you use 
any specific type of compass. You know, that's totally up to you. Okay, next question. Uh, Neil from the UK. You cover declination between north and magnetic north in the waves video. However, you never mention the difference between grid north and true north. Please can you explain why this is not an issue when navigating with a compass? Um, okay, <laughs> the difference between true north and grid north is quite simple. True north is a straight line direction to the geographic north pole. It's the point on the, at the top of the world where the earth spins on its axis. So it's just, that's true north. True north is a straight line from where you are to the geographic north pole. Grid north is the northwards direction along the vertical lines of your map. Okay, so there is a difference. Now, the grid is based on a projection. It's a 3D shape, i.e. the Earth, being projected onto a 2D piece of paper, and it's never going to work. It's never going to be accurate. Um, and it's the same with grid north. It's, grid north is slightly curved. If you imagine you've got an apple and you peel it off in thin strips, from the middle of the apple to the top of the apple, the edges of those strips are going to have to be slightly curved um, to make them all join together at the top. The reason most people use grid north and true north to, you, to mean exactly the same is because we're walking. The difference between walking five miles towards true north and five miles along you know, towards grid north is virtually non-existent. Um, the curve is so slight on the line, you know, the vertical lines on your map, that to someone who's walking it makes absolutely no difference. If you're sailing across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific, or you're flying in an aeroplane, then that curvature of the, um, the lines on the map actually make a big difference. But the distances that we're walking when we're navigating it makes no difference. True North and Grid North, on a map, you, you, in most parts of the world, you can take as being, you know, <clears throat> the difference is irrelevant when you're navigating using a handheld compass and a map. Um, so that's that. All right, so not the next question. Um, anonymous. <laughs> what would you actually do if you got lost in fair or poor weather? I say this in a lot of videos. Most, if you if you're in a, you know, you're in a plane and it crash lands in the jungle, South America, you are lost. You don't know where you are. You don't even know what country you're in. You just know you're in the jungle. Most people aren't lost. They know roughly where they are on a map. They know they're in a certain area, um, so they're not lost. They're just not exactly sure where they are at the moment. Um, in good weather, it's quite simple to find your location just by doing resections and triangulations or transits. Um, or if you don't have a compass, you can use a military decrap system. Um, I've done a full video explaining resections and triangulations and also decraps, so I'll put those in the uh, description box. Now, you say in also in poor weather, so I'm assuming you mean reduced visibility. In reduced visibility, bad weather or at night, you still aren't completely lost. You, you know approximately where you are. So in this case, you can use slope, slope aspect, you know, the direction of, if you're stood and you point your compass down a slope and it's going south, then you know you're on a south facing slope. So you look at your map and you can ignore any slopes that don't face south because you're not on them. Um, you can use handrails you, if you, by a wall, walk along a wall for 100 meters and if it comes to another wall at a right angle and you know you're on this south facing slope, look for a wall that joins another wall on a south facing slope on your map. There are lots of ways that you can find out where you are, even in reduced visibility. Um, it just means don't panic, take your time, look at your map look at your surroundings, even if it's at night, you know, you've got a head torch. I hope you've got a head torch. Um, you can find out where you are. I, I don't really have time today to go through all the techniques. So what I'll do is I'll just put links to the videos um, that I've already done about that. But 
you can very easily find out where you are in good weather at night time, reduce visibility and all the rest. The only difference is in nice in a nice bright sunny day it's going to be a lot quicker at any other time it's going to take you some time to do it but it's just a matter of going through the process okay next question um what have we got here this one is from charles what are the first steps to becoming proficient at navigating by map and compass <laughs> it's, honestly i would suggest get somebody to teach you the basics um, and then go out somewhere familiar and practice. I say go out some, that could be a local park or the, just the area around your house because what that does, that takes away the fear of being lost. Um, you know, nobody wants to go out and practice and get totally lost. Mind you, I just said that you can't get lost tonight. <laughs> anyway, so go out into somewhere that you actually know. In most parts of the world, there are courses that you can book with qualified and insured navigation instructors um, contact one of those if there isn't is there a local walking club in most walking clubs you know or trekking clubs there's always somebody who knows a good deal about navigation ask them for tips now the best thing to do if there's no walking clubs and there's no instructors available in your area to teach you go and buy a map walk outside your house point it down the road so that the road is pointing in the same direction as the road and then ask yourself, right, looking at the map, what should be a bit further on? Ah, oh, there should be a house. Walk down the road, is there a house? You've only walked maybe 100 metres, but you've started to navigate. Don't worry about buying a compass. You don't need a compass. Just buy a map of your local area and go out and practice looking at the things you can see and identifying those things on a map and then saying right from here if I walk a little bit up this way there'll be something else you can worry about using a compass later on I've actually done a full series of six videos of how to start navigation from the basics of what is a map all the way up to navigating around easy countryside. So I'll put the link to that playlist in the description box. Okay, so right, next, I'm whizzing through these, by the way, otherwise the video will be too long. Right, next question. Uh, from Mark, is there an app or a website to find a distance and compass bearing between two UTM coordinates? Um, yes, there are lots of them. But I have to say that I've never used them, so I don't know how good they are. The one that I've heard about um, is a free app you can get for your phone. I'm not recommending. I just know it exists. It's called UTM Geo Map. So if you Google on uh, UTM Geo Map, you might be able to, if you've got a decent mobile phone, you'll be able to download the app. Um, the, web, the website that I do know of is called Sun Earth Tools. That's all one word. SunEarthTools.com they that will give you the bearing and a distance between two utm coordinates i've never used either that app or those websites so give it a go and see what happens here we go next one um from roy why does no one use a running fix with land navigation <laughs> fair enough <laughs> i suppose if you're running like crazy across the uh, countryside i've never been asked that before <laughs> thanks roy um the true reason is when walkers want to find or trekkers want to find out their location they tend to be standing still um, a running fix is more of a, a sailing thing to do i'll tell you what i'll do um i won't do, i know what i'll do i'll do it on this for those who don't know what a running fix is, I'll do it on this. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Imagine you've got a coastline. So there's your coastline. Can you see that line on the thing? And here is your boat. You're, you're, you're in a boat there. Okay, you're in a boat. Now, you don't know where you are. You can see the coastline, but you don't actually know whereabouts you are, you know, there. So... On the coast, you can see something. You can see, I don't know, there's something there. So there it is. So there's something there. That, is, that could be a, um, a lighthouse or a church, church spire or something. You can see something. So what you do is you take a bearing from, from where your boat is to that something. 
okay so you've got a bearing and it could be one two three degrees or whatever you've got a bearing now you don't know whereabouts on this bearing you are you know you could be here you could be here here you, you know you're somewhere along this bearing now a running it's called a running fix because what you do is you run for or you allow the boat to sail forward. You know the direction you're going, you know the speed that you're going, but you still don't know where you are on this line. So all you do is you continue along your route for a certain time, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour. If there's any sailors watching this, by the way, and I'm getting this wrong, <laughs> let me know. And then what you do is after a while, you've sailed, you know, along a certain distance, but you still don't know where you are. You could be here, here, or here. So what you do is you then, this first bearing, you copy this first bearing, so it's here, you still know, now you know that you're on this line somewhere, but you don't know where you are. So what you do is you take another bearing from the thing that's on the shoreline, the lighthouse or what have you, and the other bearing is there, so where the two tracks cross, that's your location. So it's called a running fix. Um, it's pr the only reason I know that is because it's probably the simplest form of uh, finding out where a boat is. I, I know maritime navigation is extremely, uh, hang on, is extremely complex, but a running fix is very simple. Um, as long as these two lines join, then that's where you are. So that's, anyway, right, we don't use a running fix when we're doing land navigation because we tend to be standing still. We're not uh, doing anything else. Right, here we go. So this is from Chris. If I'm in an area with zero GMA, that's grid magnetic angle. Um, so I, I think Chris means that there's no declination in, in his area. So I know that I have a compass area of, a compass error of 10 mils east. Do I need to follow the same rule as waves or adjust my compass for the error? No. Well, Chris, 10 mils is less than, uh, I'll say just over half a degree. So I wouldn't do anything. I'd just ignore it and keep using your compass as normal. Um, having said, I think Chris is asking about an error, not just a specific 10 mils. Let's say you add 90 mils, which is five degrees then it would be quite serious. Um, yes, you have to make adjustments. You can't use your compass error as a declination adjustment because it's, not, it's nothing to do with declination. It's just that your compass doesn't work properly. So if you have 10 degree, what, what do we say it was? 10 degrees east, then each time, so in other words, your compass is pointing basically to the right of north. So each time you take a bearing or do declination or whatever you do your compass, you have to move your compass, um, you have to adjust your compass to the left by the amount of your bearing error, or sorry, your compass error. Um, if your compass error was to the west, once again, it's not a declination adjustment, it's just a broken compass. Um, so you have to adjust your compass each time, whatever you do with it. If you take a bearing of one, two, three, um, and your compass, your error is 10 degrees west, then what you need to do is you would need to rotate the dial 10 degrees to the right. I'm not even going to say east or west because it's not. It's actually left or right. Your compass is broken. I would suggest you get another compass. Um, it's nothing to do with the waves, which is um, west add versus east subtract. It's just a broken compass. Um, sooner or later, if you don't replace it, you're going to forget to do the adjustment and it's going to go wrong get a new compass. <laughs> That's my advice. Uh, what have we got here? Dave, how do I safely store long term a base plate compass so that the magnetic needle isn't affected? Um, simple, just don't store it near any electrical or magnetic devices. Try and keep it away from ferrous metals, you know, iron and what have you. It's interesting that because when you, if you buy in bulk from a company like Silver Compasses, which I do, um, is a, the compasses tend to come in boxes. Here's a couple of compasses. They come in boxes like this, almost touching, and they will have been in the silver factory maybe for a few years, and they've been stored like that. 
vertically and they're almost touching each other um, and it never seems to cause any problem also when you buy the instructor's equipment you buy a bag that you can actually store 25 compasses in there, there's only a centimeter or you know about just over a quarter of an inch um, apart between each compasses or between yeah between each compass um, so this thing about storing compasses in a certain way I don't know it's it technically it's a good idea to store them you know on their own outside 50 miles away from any magnetic or electrical interference but you know in back in the real world just try not to store them be, near to any magnetic or any electrical equipment and keep them flat if you can um, other than that it, it in the real world it's not going to make much difference i know technically you're supposed to do this that, and the other but try and keep things real anyway ah uh, martin here we go i've not seen this one how do you keep on a bearing when you've lost all visibility and you're on your own ah <laughs> that's a good question martin uh, if you've lost all visibility as an example if you're if you find yourself out in the hills at night and you haven't got a head torch my advice would be to stay still just sit down on the floor even if it's raining cold whatever just stay where you are it's going to be very uncomfortable where you are until it gets daylight again but take it from me it's better than walking off a cliff seriously if you find yourself on your own with no light and it's night time stay where you are you know if you've got a mobile phone telephone the mountain rescue team but don't go walking around because you're going to walk off something that you don't want to now if you do have a torch um, and you're on your own and you've lost visibility it's night time or whatever then you actually the methods of navigation don't change what changes is the distance in the daytime you, you, your question what was it you said how do you keep on a bearing if you take a bearing off I don't know something that's 100 meters away and you walk towards it and then when you get to that thing you do your bearing again and walk to something else another 100 meters away and you keep going on until you get to your destination at night time you can't do that because you can't see 100 meters or in thick fog or whatever so all you do is you reduce the distances if you can see 20 meters then take a bearing off something you can see in 20 meters and then walk to that and then do it again. S sometimes the uh, visibility is a lot less than 20 meters. And then it's just a, mag a matter of holding your compass in front of you and just literally walking along very slowly. Do not walk fast or you know, you're gonna walk off something. Check your map to make sure there are no obvious dangers in front of you, steep vertical drops, yeah? But the difference is at night time or in reduced visibility you do exactly the same it's just that the distance that you can see is reduced so therefore your bearing you know your compass bearing to a certain object that you're going to walk towards to is uh, is also reduced okay oh by the way the better your head torch at night time the easier that is um this one is from i'm sorry if i'm going to pronounce this wrong uh, Gaila, I think that's how you pronounce it. If 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 I pronounced it wrong, um, I'm not good with Eastern European pronunciations. Do you think I can use my Garmin Instinct watch strap as the edge of a compass? Um, yes, <laughs> it's very simple. Any straight edge will do. It doesn't, you know. I would if it was me, I wouldn't use the I wouldn't use my watch strap. I'd leave my watch on, just because I know me, and I would probably forget to put it back on and I'd lose it. Most people, if they haven't got a compass or they've, they've not got a compass with a flat edge, what they'll tend to do is they'll use the edge, they'll fold the edge of the map over. Um, in my back bearings video, I actually use that technique quite a number of times. So I'll put the link in the uh, description box. Um, but yes, fold over the edge of the map and use that as your straight edge. But if you really want to, your question was, can I use my Garmin Instinct watch strap as the edge of a compass? Yes, you can, but I wouldn't, because sooner or later you'll lose it. And uh, Garmin Instinct watches are quite expensive, so keep it on your wrist. <laughs> um, right then, next one, Lawrence. 
What compass would you recommend for somebody like myself who is 77 years old? Um, I don't really understand that, Lawrence, because, well, I understand it, but I don't really know how to answer it. Being at a certain age doesn't in itself mean that you have to use a certain type of compass. You know, it's, that's, that's the best answer. But I know what you mean. Most doctors, and I am not a doctor, I've got a first aid certificate, so I'm almost a doctor. <laughs> doctors are fuming now. Um, most doctors will probably advise that as you increase in age, your eyesight reduces. Um, so I would get something like the Sunto A30, which because that's got a very large magnifying glass. Well, relatively large to compare with other compasses. So a Sunto A30 is... Um, would be a good way forward because it's got a relatively large magnifying glass to make looking at all the fiddly bits on a map um, easier to read. Just on this point of eyesight, by the way, if you are or you know somebody else who is visually impaired, there are tactile compasses um, available. I mean, Brent Brunton does a braille compass. There are other compasses that instead of looking at the bearing, you set your bearing and it actually speaks out to you it's got a small microphone in it so there are tactile compasses if you just look on google or if you contact your local visually impaired charity they'll have a lot more details and a lot more experience of using them than i do but if you are visually impaired that doesn't stop you using a compass because there are specific types of compass designed for your condition okay now then, here we go. What's the next? Oh, this one is from somebody called Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I have a question about navigating in denser forest. So-called leapfrogging seems too time consuming if you can only move about three meters to bump into another tree. Well, Anonymous. Is that Mr. Anonymous? Miss? Mrs? I don't know. Anyway. I agree, there are an awful lot of websites and an awful lot of videos that would give you the impression that navigating through a forest is all about taking a bearing from a tree to another tree and then the next tree. Um, oh, <laughs> I'll say nothing about those. I'll, give it, I'll ask you a question. If you were navigating up a track or a slope or in an open field and there were, it was covered in boulders, would you navigate from boulder to boulder? No, you wouldn't, would you? Nobody would, that's just silly. Um, but for some reason, there's so many websites that say, when you're in a forest, you have to go from tree to the next tree to the next tree. It's, I mean, it's, well, it's silly. That's the best way to describe it. When you're navigating in a forest, treat that forest as any other form of reduced navigation but you're still navigating. Look at your map. Is, it, is there an incline? Is there a slope? Are there contour lines on your map? Are there any handrails? Are there any, handrail will be a stream or a wall or something like that. You know, you're still navigating use your, using your map and your compass. Treat a dense forest as any form of reduced visibility navigation. It may be that if you're in extremely thick forest, prime example, some mountains in Scotland are completely covered in rhododendron bushes. It started off with the Victorians who thought they looked nice. And now some mountains in Scotland have just been enveloped by these horrible things. Uh, rhododendron bushes you literally can't see more than two meters in front of you but you know if you're on a slope you, if you're on a slope and you need to go in a certain direction for a certain distance use attack points you're still navigating mind you if you do find yourself in a forest and it's perfectly flat and there are no other features for miles and miles around, you are going to have to navigate from tree to tree. But you're not going to go three meters, are you? You're going to, you can navigate as far as you can see. And if you can see a tree that's 50 meters away, take a bearing off that and then go to it and then take another bearing off another. Sooner or later, the ground will start changing. It will go up or down. And then you're back into contour lines and start using your map to navigate. 
but whatever happens you definitely don't walk three meters and then bump into another tree so navigating through a forest is slower than navigating over an open field but it's you know it's only as slow as the visibility allows so that's that what's next <laughs> whizzing through these sorry about that um that's it um i think that's all the questions so i'll do another one of these q a videos um when i've got time uh, i'll put out a video asking any, if anybody's got any questions if i've got anything wrong especially for maritime navigators if i got the running fix wrong let me know because i'm not good on maritime navigation anyway that's the uh, q a session so thanks for watching